Compañero, welcome. My name is Carlos El Chicon, and my podcast aims to bring you together with others working with SQL Server and engage in conversations to share ideas, meet old friends, and make a few new friends along the way. I call it the SQL Trail. Thanks for joining me. SQL Data Partners. Hello, compañeros. This is Carlos El Tricone, your host, and welcome to episode 137 of the SQL Data Partners podcast. It is good to have you on the SQL Trail again. And thanks, as always, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for connecting with us and giving us a little bit of your time. Our guest today is Nikki Tinson. She's a business intelligence manager coming to us from the UK. And Nikki, which we'll get into in the conversation, did not start in IT, got into IT after kind of going through a different route. Uh, and one of the things that, that she has done um, now is, so she started up a, what's was called Empowered Analytics to help coach and guide analysts through the course of their career and uh, and to give others the opportunity to, to come into analytics, right? To kind of get, give them the framework, if you will, of what they might need to do if they wanted to make the move. And that's, what our conversation is centered on today is this idea of, hey, so you want to get into analytics and uh, talking a little bit about that and what her current workload looks like. We are joined again by uh, Kevin Fiesel and Eugene Meininger. They're with us and they give their take. These are interesting guests as well because they have done a very similar thing or are trying to do that. And so we talk a little bit about uh, the challenges, struggles, and uh, current status, if you will, of where everybody is there. Do want to give a couple of compañero shout outs. Uh, The first to uh, Peter Hall and uh, to everyone digging on my Las Vegas suit on uh, social media. I attended the the GE Centricity Conference in Vegas. And uh, one of the things we sponsored and one of the things we were looking to do as a a, uh, small fish in a big pond is to stand out. and so. I posted up uh, a picture of me in the suit and it got, got a lot of responses on the social media, but also uh, in person as well. I got a lot of different looks <laughs> in addition to the ones that I, I normally get with that suit. So for time's sake, we're going to skip uh, the SQL Server in the news this week. But I do want to talk about the, the conference, the SQL Trail. I need to stop calling it a conference. Uh, the event, the gathering, right? So the data platform gathering on the East Coast. In Richmond, Virginia, October 10th through the 12th, we have put together or compiled the, the YouTube video from uh, what happened last year with some attendee feedback and, and whatnot. It's kind of a promotional video, but I think it does give some insights into what it is that we're trying to do. And it's always nice to have some feedback and others' experiences. So that's up on YouTube and we'll make, uh, make sure that it's up on the site as well. And so if you're interested in looking at that, then you can head out to sequeltrail.com. I am happy to announce that we do have our Friday lab in place. I'm not going to announce that just today. We actually talk about it uh, next week. Kevin, Eugene, and I are going to do an episode by ourselves, and uh, we're going to talk about it a, a bit more there next week. So our URL for the uh, show notes for today's episode is going to be sqldatapartners.com slash analytics, and that is going to be with an S, or sqldatapartners.com slash 137. And so with that, let's go ahead and get into the conversation uh, with Nikki. Nikki, welcome to the program. Hi, Carlos. Thank you for having me. It's very exciting. Yes, it's always nice having a guest from the UK, right, to join with us. Thank you. And your topic is extremely interesting as well. It's one that we get asked quite a bit as we see some of the marketing shift, right, and where where the new jobs, if you will, are going to be happening. And this idea of how do I get into analytics? Yeah. And uh, what could be my course if I'm not currently doing that? So why don't you give us a little background about how you got into analytics and why you think others uh, might find it an interesting career path? Yeah, well, great question. I'm, I'm going to be really honest. At the start of my career, I chose to go to university and I had absolutely no intention of being where I am now. If you'd asked me kind of 15 years ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing now. So I'm currently working as a business intelligence manager in the UK. 
And there is absolutely no way I would have envisaged myself doing this. So um, originally, I was going to go into educational psychology, oh, wow. which meant working with children. I did a psychology degree. So I actually did some statistics, inadvertently planned. <laughs> I obviously <laughs> knew what was coming. So it's been a while since I've got done any standard deviation just to preempt any questions <laughs> coming up later. But <laughs> So I just happened to do that in my degree. So I was going to go into EdSight and I had to do um, teaching and I was going to do a master's. And when I left my degree, I did a teaching qualification. And then when I left that, and it was amazing. All of my experience was with kids, like everything. Hmm. Nothing was with data at all. Hmm. And then when I was trying to find a job, I couldn't get a job. We had a massive funding problem over here and um, loads of teachers were made redundant. Wow. That first year after leaving uni was just really awful. And you obviously appreciate how much money you spend at uni. So I kind of come out of this degree and I was like, uh, what is going on? I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to do this. And it was a massive curveball. And I really didn't know what to do. And I guess after about a year, I ended up working for a, a local government. And I was working with an organization called Sure Start. And I think in the US, it's similar to sort of Head Start, I think, sort of years gone by. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of helping children in areas of deprivation and sort of health outcomes and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of data that they collect to prove that that funding is making a difference. So that was really actually the start of my data career because I ended up working in a team that were very heavily on the data side. And um, they worked with access databases back then and sort of collating information, bringing it together, giving that to management. And so that was really the start of my journey. And, and I think what was really interesting about that was my desire to work with that particular subject was really something that really inspired me. And that kind of connection to the why, like what problem am I solving here? Why am I doing this? And I ended up moving away from local government and into the private sector and actually ended up working in mortgages where I covered predictive analytics in that kind of role. But it was a really interesting sort of start to that. And it's just really gone on from there. So now I work, as I say, a business intelligence manager. And honestly, the, the journey has just been really interesting. I've constantly been doing things I never thought I would do. I do a lot of data warehouse development now as well. And again, five years ago, that would have terrified me. <laughs> so it's just... <laughs> sure. Now, when we say data warehouse development, you're talking about like ETL, maybe SSIS packages, yeah. things like that. Okay. Yeah, a bit. I've used a bit of SIS packages. We don't really need it so much for our data. We tend to use a lot of stored procedures and we can kind of like get the data in, in those kind of ways. But um, yeah, inserting data and, you know, again, that kind of more BI developer type of role. Sure. But all really important, again, solving problems with trying to make your queries performant and, you know, not kind of taking forever for data to run. And that's a huge challenge in the data field, making sure that you've got good, solid foundations there before you can even make anything meaningful out of it. Right. No, I think that's also interesting that you mentioned, you know, some of those those tasks, because I feel like it's not a super gap. I feel like a lot of times those who aren't in analytics but are working with data yeah. feel like, oh gosh, right? There's like this huge chasm to where I need to get to be able to start working with analytics. Yeah. Chances are that moving data from one system to the other is something you're going to have to encounter pretty quickly when working with data. Yes. And it's just kind of an evolution of that or getting better at those skills, at least part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, when I've kind of looked, I mean, data science is the new term that everyone kind of loves and it right. covers so much stuff. And actually, when you look at the kind of really broad kind of definition of data science, it really encompasses all of the things that we're looking at now. So your kind of construction of tables, you know, making sure it's performing, um, understanding that DBA side, because it's just really critical because you can't wait for hours for, you know, data to run especially when you're dealing with big data, sure. really understanding that foundation. But it also covers the kind of collation, understanding the business processes, getting out into the business, talking to people, getting a real sense of what that data means. And then the predictive analytics and the machine learning side of it, which 
is the bit that like, I guess for any of us that like the kind of analytics side, that's the bit you really want to get to. That's a really exciting bit. But it's like 90% of the other stuff is what takes your time. So that the bit that's really kind of what you maybe want to do is quite a small proportion of time, I guess, because you've got to get those foundations there. Right. I'm going to use this as an excuse to, to bring in Kevin and Eugene here because I know that they have kind of moved over more to that analytic space there as well. Yeah. And so I guess, guys, would you would you agree that you have to have that base before you can move over? Or I guess, what's been your experience and, and what how much have you been able to retain, if you will, as you've moved into more analytic roles? Sure, I'll go first. Hi, Kevin Fiesel, professional podcast guest, and happened to be running a predictive analytics team. But that's kind of a side project. Being a podcast guest is the main main deal. <laughs> so hearing the description, I'm completely in agreement. I think that a lot of what we think of as really advanced analytics work is the stuff that we've been doing for decades. It's ETL or maybe ELT, if you're going to be fancy that way. Right. It's moving data from one system to another system. It's understanding data models, data rules, data contexts. It's trying to figure out how things fit together. And most importantly, most of your time is going to be spent working with the awful, awful data that's on hand, <laughs> the dirty data that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, Nikki threw out the number 90%. Completely agreement. Actually, I broke down. One of my questions was going to be how much time you spend data cleansing on projects. And I had written down 90 plus or minus five. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be underestimating the amount of time too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. We must be right then. Surely. <laughs> Two independent what are the points. chances? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think um, a question that I want to lead into here is, do you see a separation there from data engineering versus data science, the two sets of roles? Or do you see this as one role? I personally think that it's going to depend on the business. I mean, I love working for probably mid-sized companies because you get this more end-to-end experience. So in the role that I'm in at the moment, um, I get to kind of go from that BI developer, the kind of ETL side, you know, the DBA sort of parts of it, all the way to literally getting into the business, speaking to people who are not tech at all and understanding the business processes and looking at how we can add value. And for me, having that complete end-to-end experience. One is very rewarding because I get to see that when I'm, you know, sat in front of code trying to make it more performant, (laughs) and it's not something that I kind of want to do all the time, I understand why I'm doing it and I understand the kind of end game. So for me, I find it very helpful having that. I guess where there's a challenge for kind of more enterprise level businesses is that the data is so vast, the teams and the kind of business is so massive that it probably is more difficult to, for that to happen realistically. But, you know, I guess that's the question. I don't know for a bigger company, what's your opinion of that? Okay. Um, also, probably should give my quick definitions of the two for people in the audience who don't know what data engineering is versus data science. And we just, yeah. just kind of talked about it without actually explaining it. For me, data engineering is the stuff that we've been talking about that we do so long. It's taking data, moving it from source to source. It's working with the models, the data cleansing. It's doing the stuff that is plumbing. You know, we're data plumbers. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we used to call them ETL specialists. We've called them other things along the way. But it's today, the term that'll get you most money is data engineering. (laughs) And the difference is now we're expecting to learn new things like, oh, well, I need to be able to pull data from a Spark cluster, or I need to be able to run Kafka streams and get data from lots of devices through very quickly. So the number of sources has just increased. Mm. That's the fundamental difference. Yes, it's not the style of the job. It's just the the boxes that you're checking that you know how to do. (laughs) And I see by contrast, data science is more of a statistical analysis. Uh, There's the old joke that a data scientist is a data analyst who lives in California. (laughs) (laughs) Basically, you you add the term data scientist, like I'm an analyst. Ah, I'm a data scientist now. Pay me three times as much. I'll do the same work. But when you have the opportunity to specialize, if these are the people who aren't necessarily doing as much of 
trying to figure out why row number four and row number five are supposed to have the same value but don't because they have different keys somewhere. And more time trying to figure out how many layers this convolutional neural network really should have. Did we lose you, Kevin? No, no, I think I just killed all the conversation is all. <laughs> you got really excited about some of the nitty gritty. It, so- it sounded like you weren't quite done, right? I was like, okay. <laughs> you had to say convolutional neural network, Kevin. Somebody's bingo card just got checked out. I was like, I win. Spark, Kafka. I'm waiting for GDPR. I think that's the center square. Cause... Oh, man, don't get me started on that. <laughs> but it's interesting, actually. We, sorry, I'm going to make a comment about GDPR, but that just goes to show you how valuable data is. It's and that's just going to, you know, explode, I think, over the next few years as well, kind of analysts within the GDPR area. And it's huge. And I think for anyone sort of starting off, I kind of, you know, I sort of feel sorry for people in a way, because where do you start with all of this? You know, if you've got no experience of any of this, it's kind of like, there's a lot of just tech, you know, even if you're just looking at the kind of just the predictive analytics and the machine learning and that sort of data science the kind of algorithms and and really, you know, looking at that data in that way, that is like a vast kind of arena. And to become an expert in that alone is, you know, I probably feel now in my career, I've got a good foundation and now I can start to kind of look into that and lean into that. But to even kind of go there, I think, is a big undertaking, I think. Right. Yeah, that, that is interesting. So you do have to have that base to do some of these things. And I guess we, we've talked about, you know, some variations here. So coming from a, maybe a different path than we've come. Yes, absolutely. Maybe closer to what you came from, Nikki. And that is, I want to call them Excel masters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. For the folks that can slice and dice Excel, yeah. do you feel like that could potentially give them at least a good enough base or at least, a, you know, an understanding that they know how to work with those numbers so they could start making some of those leaps? Yeah, I would actually sort of say Excel is a really, really good starting point. And because there's actually a lot you can do in Excel now that even sort of five years, you know, things have kind of developed and you've got things like Power Query Mm -hmm. and Power Pivot in there. So to be able to kind of connect data in that way within Excel, I mean, that's a massive leap. You know, I used to use Access Databases. I wouldn't need to do that now to kind of get all that data together. Because, you know, for a lot of businesses, they're not, again, they're not even in a place where they necessarily have their data in one system. I mean, I'm lucky because I work in an organization where we use Dynamics Nav, which is a a ERP system. So as an analyst, I'm like, I've got all my data in a database. (laughs) It's in one place. I have no kind of random spreadsheets, you know, elsewhere. So that in itself is a huge hurdle. But again, for sort of slightly smaller sized businesses, they don't necessarily have that luxury, but they still need that information and they need to get it understood and read in. So yeah, going back to your question, I think Excel is a really, a really good starting point. I think there are pretty much all the fundamentals are there. I think it really is about kind of trying to get very proficient in one thing before you start adding lots of other pieces of tech to it, because there's things you do in Excel, which Like when I eventually started writing SQL code, it's the same concept, isn't it? It's like an if statement or a case statement. Conceptually, you get what you're trying to do with the data. And I think visually, again, if you've not come from a technical background, which I hadn't, I got visually the way data kind of strings together and connects. So then when I started writing code, it was like, oh, okay, that makes so much sense. So it just comes very straightforward. And And I think that if you try and deal with too much in one sitting, you kind of don't get anywhere. That's the danger. So I think it's kind of becoming a bit of an expert in one thing at a time. So I think the goal is to try and help some of those people who are looking to maybe transition to analytics. I I think we should probably make kind of a distinction. And I don't know what the right term is, but maybe between kind of some traditional BI or regular analytics or what Microsoft a lot of time calls like advanced analytics. And I'm kind of like stuck in the middle between the two. And I want to make the leap into advanced analytics. But I think with a lot of regular BI, you know, business intelligence, you can lean on the business for validation. And so you have a tighter feedback cycle and you have a a shorter distance to go, right? Because when someone in accounting just wants to see year over year growth, they can validate that data. They can validate the result and go, that doesn't look right. 
they have a way to check that. Yes. Whereas when you start to move into advanced analytics, you need extra education, extra training, because you need to be able to validate the model or the data outside of the business once you get into either predictive or prescriptive, right? So Kevin was talking about a neural network. Well, how do you know it's working right? How do you know your model's working right? If you make a model that says, okay, we want to reduce customer churn, so we should intervene at this point. Well, the business can't look at that and go, that makes sense, because you're telling the business what to do. And so you need this extra understanding of statistics and data science and modeling and that sort of thing. And so I think for a lot of people, they really should be focusing on that first step, that first foundation that you talked about of just kind of regular analytics, regular business intelligence, where it's maybe a little bit more descriptive or a little bit more summarization and KPIs versus what the cool new hotness is now, the machine learning, the data science, the thing that you're supposed to have a PhD in statistics in. So I think I don't know what the right term is to make that split, but I think for people looking to transition, a lot of them are maybe looking at the fact that data scientists are making, you know, 130 grand when really they should look at, okay, well, how can I learn, like you said, Power Query and Power Pivot? That can get you pretty far, and yeah. especially if you're in a non-coding role. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, and the best example I could give to kind of explain all of this is, um, did you guys watch The Karate Kid, the, the 1980s version? Of okay. course. A long time ago. It's a good version. Good. Well, so when um, Mr. Miyagi, I think it is, he's teaching Daniel, the Karate Kid, how to do karate. And at the end, he's obviously amazing at it. But he gets him to go and wash his car and it's like, wax on, wax off. And he's like, why are you getting me to do all this rubbish stuff? This is really boring. I don't want to do this. And it's kind of, this is how I feel about like data and data science, because there is a lot of stuff you've just got to get stuck into that you don't necessarily want to do that isn't as high profile, but you have to do it to get good at what you do. And at the end, yeah, you kind of can become a karate kid in data science, I guess. But it's that there is a lot of effort and time going into that initial work. We haven't really even touched the soft skills here because Getting out and understanding your business and how it works is so crucial in my mind to to understanding business processes. Right. And this is where I think the non-technical folks have an edge Mm. because they are a bit more attuned to some of those. And it wouldn't be so irregular to adopt a vertical. Whereas from a tech, you think the tech can apply everywhere. (laughs) <laughs> and you're like, well, if I only do healthcare, or if I only do, you know, uh, government, or I only do, uh, you know, finance, somehow I'm pigeonholing myself. But if you're non-technical, right, that that idea of of having that vertical is almost that's the first option, or that's the first choice that you make. And then you go and find out more about that and figure out how you can apply skills to that area. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think that kind of, you know, I guess the challenge for all of us is like, what's the problem we're trying to solve being the kind of first point and everything else kind of like, it kind of comes to you, I think, because then when you're focusing on the problem you're trying to solve. So like, I don't know, I was thinking of like Netflix, for example, they will use kind of um, algorithms to work out what sort of, you know, movies you might want to watch. But ultimately, they're doing that to try and keep you engaged and get you coming back for more and continuing to pay the you know monthly subscription right so when you get really super focused on what behavior are we trying to encourage then you kind of step back from there it's not like you just kind of go i'm just gonna analyze a load of data and look at algorithms etc you look at the business problem you're trying to solve and you kind of move back and that's i guess again for people who are not as deeply technical that's a bit less scary because you're kind of kind of makes conceptual sense I think and then you can kind of tag on those other elements to it more naturally. So when it comes to learning these basic skills getting started how much of that is the statistics itself or in other words how much of a stats background do we need in order to get started in analytics from some other field? So my view is, and this might be controversial, so feel free to disagree (laughs) with me, but I don't think you need to have a stats background. I happened to have one when I did my psychology degree, because that was, you know, psychology is a science, essentially. So there's statistical significance and you learn about kind of chi-squared and t-tests and regressions and all that kind of stuff. 
So I happen to have come from that background, but I ironically found that when I worked for local government, I was like, oh, you know, I, I know I understand T-tests and, you know, because they got me in for a data sort of side. And I was really kind of quite excited about bringing that in. And honestly, <laughs> it kind of went down like a lead balloon <laughs> because I wasn't meeting people where they were at and I wasn't trying to solve their problems. I was trying to go, look at what I know. I know all this stuff and kind of force it on people. And I think where I had to learn was to kind of step back and go, okay, just hold that for when it's helpful. So like when I worked in mortgages, they're very heavy on the predictive analytics with the credit scoring. So that was perfect. You know, that stuff started to then naturally come in because again, that was relevant to what problem they were solving at that point. But when I worked in local government, just trying to explain <laughs> how a bar chart kind of worked was was a challenge for me. <laughs> like just even the kind of concept of averages at times was quite quite difficult. And so I think that again, those are kind of touching then on the softer skills when you go in of just being really sensitive to the environment you're in, wherever that is. And I honestly believe that in your career, if you focus on solving people's problems, you will naturally learn the tech as you go along. You'll do it in a much more manageable way. And it won't feel like it's overwhelming because you are going to kind of pick it up, you know, incrementally. And so going back to the statistics stuff, if you happen to work in an industry where, for example, in mortgages, in the finance world, predictive analytics is massive. um, Again, they're going to drip feed things to you. So you will learn what you need to in the job. So we did a lot of scorecard monitoring, but I actually didn't need to have done my degree and have that stats background because I naturally was kind of mentored through it. So again, I think if you're in an industry where it's important, they'll have relevant kind of training for you to help you through it. Okay. And following up from this on a completely different subject, so it's (laughs) the ultimate (laughs) follow-up, is a lot of your work Does it tend to be more project-based or is it kind of a continual free flow of got to do this one thing real fast and I got to do another thing real fast? It feels like a a bit of a mixture of both at times. It is essentially project work where in the past I've had kind of regular tasks to do. To use a database term, more of a front-end role. Now it is a lot more kind of project-based because I'm in an IT environment. Okay. So what does one of those projects look like? So it might be about looking at kind of reducing costs in a certain area of our business. So that might mean that in order to provide management with information that they need about costs in that area, we might need to look at some of it can be quite detailed logic at times. So getting that into the data warehouse might be, you know, making that decision about putting it there. So again, you're kind of right back to you know, those foundations and kind of getting that data in, in a way that we can, you know, before we can even analyze it, doing some prototype work, then feeding that prototype work into the data warehouse where we can kind of make it a bit more stable and then providing the regular reporting off the back of that. Because I'm in an IT environment now, my mindset is very much about automation. So Mm. I don't want to be kind of churning out the same reports if people can just access them themselves. So we use Power BI a lot. Once we've got all of that stuff, all of the data in the data warehouse, we can kind of get it built up in Power BI and then people can kind of slice it how they need to. And again, you know, those data visualization tools, I mean, they've come on phenomenally. And again, the last sort of five to 10 years. And that, again, makes your job much more automated. So then you can start focusing on edging towards the more of the kind of advanced analytics, like you say. Going back to what you were saying before, one of the challenges is also that it can be easy to firefight because we might get ad hoc analysis every now and again. And if you're not careful, I think just kind of taking a step out of it, if you're not careful, you can kind of get dragged into that. So you're not necessarily focusing on what's going to add the most value to a business because you're just kind of giving everybody all the information they want all the time. And there's always information you can provide. It's endless. Mm. So I think you have to have like quite a lot of control in this area because you can literally create reports forever and ever and ever. <laughs> right, right. Definitely a challenge. 
How often do the outputs of your projects end up being services instead of reports or dashboards or visuals? So when you say services, what sorts of things do you mean? <laughs> Something I'm loading the question by getting into microservices, but in other words, a process that's running that maybe you have a, a real-time predictor or some process that you're expecting somebody else to call and pass in input data and you give them back out the outputs that uh, you're generating. So you mean the kind of like the machine learning side of things is that what you're thinking? Yeah, so a, a predictor function or something that some other part of the organization is going to plug in to fill up their Excel spreadsheet with results for yeah. what the next quarter's budgets are going to look like. Yeah, so in the role that I'm in, um, I don't. we don't tend to use it so much, but I would say that there are areas that I think we could go into. I work in more of a kind of like factory type of production environment. So, it, so I, it, I'm in the mm. automotive industry and so we refurbish vehicles and it's all about getting those cars sort of in and out of the factory as quickly as possible. So for us, it's very different to an organization like a mortgage company or an organization like Amazon, for example, which are kind of like putting things, you know, buy this, this is the kind of information we know about you and we can kind of like encourage your behavior and that kind of thing. But what, what, I, what I feel, so I don't really tend to do that kind of work where I am. But I think that's a mindset partly. So I think some organizations are very traditionally focused on predictive analytics and really kind of lean towards machine learning. I mean, I think kind of finance is like a massive one. So for example, if you ring up for a mortgage or a credit card and they do a credit scoring on you and you get that kind of like, we're going to approve you straight away or, you know, you guys need to see an underwriter. Those kinds of environments really lend themselves naturally, I think, towards that kind of advanced analytics. And I think there are other areas that don't as much or haven't historically, but I think there's a shift in mindset because I think there are areas where we could do that. But I think that, again, trying to empower businesses to think differently about machine learning. So kind of really helping analysts to think about what could you do in your business to to do things differently rather than just waiting for people to give you work to do and i think that's quite a challenging area yeah and i don't know what whether you guys see that in the work that you do so um actually about that and kind of a selfish question but i think it ties in a lot of things we've been talking about i i think there's definitely at least in the work that i do there's a lot more space for thinking analytically and and using some of this technology and you talked about how it's not necessary a lot of times to have a statistics background to get started. And a lot of times you can learn a lot of this stuff on the job. And so kind of the question I have for you is, in your mind, where's the point where the job isn't doing enough to kind of keep pushing you forward? And you should start maybe looking outside and say, okay, well, maybe we're not doing very much with or anything with machine learning in our job. But if I could actually just learn how to get started with it, then it might be an easy sell to my boss or something like that. At what point do you think it makes sense to not depend on the job to drip feed you the next thing, but instead say, okay, I need to start taking some more initiative here? Yeah. I think if you're the person that, you know, in that, in that scenario where you're kind of going, okay, when do I take the initiative? I think there's a sort of probably like a, a tilting point in someone's career where they are just really ready for those next challenges. And I generally would say they're in the more sort of senior analyst type of roles. I think when, when you've essentially focused on solving the problems of your business, when things are a little bit more settled and you can get the attention of your, you know, mm. either your direct boss or the people above them, then I think that's often a good point to kind of bring this stuff in. So if, you know, if you're in a position in your business where, you know, you're going in on a weekly basis, queries are running really slowly, you know, there's loads of locking going on, right. that's probably not going to be a good time to kind of go, oh, can we do some machine learning? Because, <laughs> you know, the people that, you know, you're speaking to might be like, well, we kind of like we're in a fire at the moment and no. So I think when things are settled and there's always going to be things to do, so this is the risk, but. I think when you're not firefighting, when things are fairly stable, then that's the point at which you 
can even of yourself just kind of think about, well, you know, kind of if I was in charge, what would I do differently? What would potentially add huge amounts of value to the business? You know, right. how can we bring in that extra million pounds, you know, and, and think blue sky? Because for me, I think as an analyst and having that background, having that entrepreneurial mindset really starts to set you apart. And I think that's those predictive analytics and the kind of advanced stuff is really about thinking about things that you can't really see yet. So it's it's seeing the opportunity where other people don't. So those kind of skills mentally and, and just giving yourself some time to even think about that, then I think that, you know, you might be able to find a couple of areas in the business where you could potentially sort of bring that in. And then that's a good starting point to go and speak to your boss about some, even some initial pieces of training. I guess the question would be then, what training would you recommend to... You know, it's funny. I can say what I'm looking at right now. I I think Kevin's probably gonna have a better answer because he he does more of this like next level stuff. But I think if nothing else, it, it sounds silly, but just starting to go through Khan Academy, just so you understand some of the vocabulary of some of this stuff. Yeah. If you don't have that, that statistics background, because I don't know, as I've been going through it, it's kind of amazing how much of it interlocks into each other. You know, just you, you, there's so many of these different pieces. And it's like when you're programming, you want to get to the point where an if statement is so non, you don't even have to think about it. You just breathe it. Or when you're writing SQL, like I'm at the point in my career where I can write a select statement at three in the morning, sleep deprived without any problem. I can write an if statement, sleep deprived without any problem. (laughs) Telling you the exact difference between standard deviation and variance at three in the morning, (laughs) not quite there yet. Right. But you, yeah. you, I mean, you could probably tell us the difference between a T test and a, was it chai, chi? I can't even pronounce it. Oh, right? chai square. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I probably couldn't. It's been a while. No, that's fair. <laughs> but you get the idea where. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if someone's just starting to look at that next level, probably just Khan Academy and just starting to pick up some of the, the very, very basics. So you have that vocabulary to even think about it. Cause there's so many pieces of just vocab you need to, to move forward certainly stuff when I've like connected with other analysts there is this feeling like people really want to kind of get into this neural networks which I know nothing about just want to say that (laughs) and it sounds really interesting but it's kind of like it's almost like you either do a PhD or I don't know like a week's course somewhere which it's like one extreme to the other and clearly you can't learn you can't be an expert in a week so it's that kind of like that mentorship side of this as well, I think is so important, Mm. kind of having people to kind of help walk you through and show you that. And and I think that's going to be the challenge, particularly over the next 10 years in this space of people who who have that skill set, who can kind of come and walk with people in businesses who know their business, but they don't understand this advanced analytics side to come and help them see the potential, but also kind of walk them through it because, you know, realistically, you know, I wouldn't do a PhD right now. I don't know whether I'd ever do a PhD anyway, but um, but I wouldn't do that right now. And it just seems a shame to kind of miss out on this area that's very exciting and very, very useful. On that topic, are there any other resources that you might recommend for somebody who's interested in getting started in the field? Yeah. Um, so do you, do you mean, again, literally just kind of getting started out? Uh, if, if you have a little bit of a background, but you're not doing it for a living, you don't have the strong academic background, but you're interested in moving forward and building up some of these skills, but you don't necessarily have a mentor directly around you. So if Carlos wants to stop being a DBA, and he, he's, he's so excited yeah. by this podcast episode, he wants to become a data analyst. I'm already working on my resume, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> well, on that note, Carlos, I do actually have a CV building course for people who want to be a data analyst. So if you're interested, I can send you that. Oh, there you go. And we'll make sure we put it up on the podcast, the show notes for today's episode. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would say places like edX and Coursera, there's actually some good free courses out there. So, you know, we talked about um, Excel earlier. Definitely think if you've not got any other experience, start there. So yeah, edX, Coursera. You know, if you're in a business and they're happy to give you some training, you know, Plural Site, Pragmatics Works. I um, you know, I've used their training. Um, that's very, very focused on the kind of Excel and Power BI and that kind of arena. So there's some really good 
free courses out there. There's some very good paid ones. And I think that going back to my analogy of the karate kid earlier, it's about practice. So I would recommend that people don't try and just saturate themselves with learning. Don't try and learn everything about Excel, for example, because there are things about Excel I don't know, and I know quite a lot about Excel. So, you know, it would be like focus on VLOOKUPs and pivot tables because the concept of joining data sets together and summarizing them, you know, you've got that in those two elements. So get a couple of data sets and use some VLOOKUPs to get some data connected to them. And that's kind of a pretty good place to start, really. And, and practice, 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 practice. Yeah, a couple more resources I would throw out, especially on the side of learning with R or Python. Mm. Data Camp is usually very good. Oh, yeah. They have a, a set of good courses, some of them free, some of them paid. And a question that I have is, what's your opinion on doing Kaggle competitions? Is this the, um, like, they have sort of data sets, do they? I think I have come across Kaggle. Yes. So Kaggle is a website that they have a set of competitions. Some of them are data sets that are generally publicly available and the competition is going on forever. Really, it's just a way to test out your skills. Like they have one data set, which is housing prices in Ames, Iowa. They also have a series of active competitions where companies will pay money. They put out a prize that says, if the best model to solve this problem will get this much money. One big example was there was a major airline in the U.S. which put together a competition to try to reduce the delay times for flights under the idea that every second that they could save is millions of dollars over time. So any way to improve the way that they could schedule and reduce delays and keep planes in the air for longer saves them so much money that they're happy to pay out a few hundred thousand dollars. That's amazing. Yeah, that is great. My thoughts are just that, you know, working with data is an incredible career. I think it literally have gold at our fingertips. It's, there's so much opportunity there. And I mean, there's an organization called Data Kind, which are using encouraging data scientists to volunteer to work with different companies to, you know, literally end poverty in certain parts of the world or whatever those kind of organizations do. And it goes to show you what we can do with data. So, yeah. The sky is the limit. Okay. Very good. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here, Nikki. Before we let you go, I started doing Kenneth Fisher's crossword puzzles, and I've started here with this best practices. I want to throw a couple of these out to the group here and see if we can come up with an answer. So I am looking at four down. And admittedly, this is mostly for DBAs, but so it says adding this option will almost always speed up your backup. 11 characters. Buffer count. Ooh. No, I was going to go with compression. And I guess I should say, so the second letter is an O. I think compression is the answer there. Let's see. I've got eight across. It says, do this regularly or corruption may sneak up on you. How many letters? Uh, let's see. Seven. Check DB. Check DB. I think that's right. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So I, I have the wrong group here, right? So I'm asking a bunch of DBA right. questions to the, to the analytics guys. <laughs> so my last question, because honestly, I don't know what this is. It doesn't bode well for us. <laughs> and it's a three-letter word that says, how long will it take you to recover? RTO. Come on. <laughs> uh, it's an acronym. That's Database 101. That's like in the MTA certification. Ta-da. For databases. I was not thinking of acronym. This, so, so, oh, man, come on. Look at that. See, now you guys have embarrassed me, Gene. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even a real DBA. I just play one. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, Nikki, should we go ahead and do SQL Family? Let's do it. So, all-time favorite movie, of course, that you wish to publicly declare. Oh, I managed to whittle it down to two. So you're, you're going to have to take this. Okay, here we go. So I've got Inception, which had Leonardo DiCaprio in it. Uh, is that why, right? Is that, you know, <laughs> let me just list the Leonardo DiCaprio movies. Is no, that no, it <laughs> it's all about the kind of un the subconscious mind. And I kind of like that stuff anyway. So um, I kind of gotcha. like that. Okay. Yeah. 
keep you on your toes. But then also, because, you know, I have to bring something more humorous into it. Guardians of the Galaxy as well. It's just so funny. So those are the two. There you go. So Karate Kid, was Karate Kid like in a, the top five? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's just that's good for analogies. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. Okay, a food that reminds you of your childhood. Oh, well, in British style, it's got to be roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. There you go. Okay, now I'm curious, right? So when you're when you're looking for roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, where do you go to get it? Oh, you well, making it? Or? Mm, oh, pubs do it so well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is a good excuse yeah. to go out for a meal. <laughs> Very nice. The city or place you most want to visit? Well, this is a hard one as well. So, such tough questions. Um, apart from the crossword, that was really hard. <laughs> so I'm a bit generic about place, but I would like to see the Northern Lights at some point. Very nice. So I kind of, yeah, that would be amazing. Now tell us, how did you first get started with SQL Server? We know you came from the, you know, the education space. So yeah. when was the first experience you had working with SQL Server? So I managed to pick up a bit of SQL when I worked in the mortgage sector because we it's very common to use SaaS. So the, the statistical package as opposed to the analysis services. Right. And so within SAS, there was um, a procedure called PROC SQL. And um, that was my introduction to like SQL, um, the kind of SQL kind of construct. And then I thought, well, you know, I was sort of looking to be more challenged. So I realized that a lot of companies use SQL Server. So I thought, well, if I can use, you know, PROC SQL, it's the same construct. It's just, you know, in a, in a slightly different environment. So that's fine. So the very first time I used it was in a test that was sprung on me <laughs> at an interview. I wasn't told that I was <laughs> going to use it. And there are just very slight variations like, you know, whether you need to use semicolons and that kind of stuff that make the query not run. <laughs> so sure. my technical test was not great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I managed to, you know, charm my way into the job and I've been there ever since. So it was all good. <laughs> well, there you go. Very nice. If you could change one thing about SQL Server, and I guess we could add, right, since so you're using some of the other tools as well, maybe you know, SSIS or SSIS as well, but what, if you could change one thing, what would it be? Oh, I'd say they're all hard questions. This was particularly difficult because probably up to using sort of 2012 onwards, prior to that, I would say them not having the ability to use the lead and lag functions. So I know you could use like um, CTEs to get data from different rows, but it was a bit long-winded. Right. So prior to then, I'd be like, give me the you know, lead function, that kind of thing. And now they've got it. So I'm, I'm pretty happy, actually. So, yeah. Very nice. What's the best piece of career advice you've received? Um, I haven't received it directly myself. It was what I read in a book. So um, years ago now, I read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, who's the CEO of Facebook. And mm -hmm. Lean In is all about kind of women in leadership roles and kind of, you know, trying to encourage women to think about the career and, and all of that stuff. And there were a couple of pieces in that that were really, really interesting. And you sort of touched on it in one of your podcasts around the imposter syndrome. So the whole concept of Lean In, which is if you get the opportunity to be around the table, you know, Lean In, like get involved. And particularly in like a sort of data analysis environment, you know, often you are the most junior person in the room at times. You might be with managers and directors and, you know, CEOs, and it can be really unnerving, but they are all amazing opportunities. So that was one thing from the book. And, and also this concept of, um, she uses the term tiara syndrome. So this kind of thing of, you know, people think just sit there and don't say anything and just work really hard and you'll get noticed. But she says, you know, just go for it. And, you know, again, it's this concept of leaning in. Don't just kind of wait for things to happen. Go and get them. So I love it. Very good. Good advice. We didn't really touch too much on that in this discussion, but that idea, right, of kind of encouraging women to get into the field, it is wide open and there are lots of access points. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, again, I think you've touched on this in podcasts where everyone's got a place. It's kind of just really valuing yourself in it, knowing that you've got something to bring and that you can add value. Yeah, definitely. Nikki, our last question for you today. If you could have one superhero power, what would it be and why do you want it? 
I've gone for breathing underwater and being able to kind of explore oceans. Oh. I did kind of think about the flying, but yeah, like breathing underwater and exploring. There seems to be like a lot of places we don't know about. There you go. I, I guess living on an island, right? We'll, we'll do that. You know, might <laughs> do that to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Well, Nikki, thanks so much for being on the program today. Uh, we had a great time. Thank you for having me. It was amazing. Thank you so much. And I feel we've had some good discussions about data science. <laughs> so thanks again, Nikki, for joining with us today. Really appreciate it. And of course, Kevin and Eugene for, for jumping in and, and their contributions as well. Now, if we did extract a little bit of the conversation from this podcast, and if you want to hear uh, Kevin, Eugene, and Nikki kind of bat around the idea of the differences between artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus data science, you can hang on to the end, and we'll play that snippet uh, there after the end. If you want to take a peek at uh, Nikki's Empowered Analytics, that is actually a Facebook page, so facebook.com slash Empowered Analytics. You can take a peek at her course and some of the materials that she has. For those of you who want to get more into analytics or ways to get started, that might be a great resource for you there. That's going to do it for today's episode, compañeros. Thanks again, as always, for tuning in. We do appreciate it. We hope that we'll see some of you in October at SQL Trail. Uh, we do still have some slots available. If there is something that you think we should be talking about on the, on the program, please let me know. Uh, you can reach out to me on social media or on LinkedIn. I do enjoy connecting uh, with you on LinkedIn. I've gotten to know most of you. We have you know quick conversations and uh, I'd love to keep those going. Uh, but you can reach me at Carlos L. Chacon and we'll see you on the SQL Trail. SQL Data Partners. No, my last... Question that I've got in order to be fully buzzword compliant in the year 2018, <laughs> could you please tell me the difference between artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus data science? Are they really the same thing or are they really different things? You're mean. I, it's very late in the UK. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look at the time. <laughs> You're breaking up. I can't hear you. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I am going to be really honest. I'm not sure I could explain artificial intelligence as well as I know you can. <laughs> but I think, so my understanding of data science be more of a kind of a broad, sort of from the, the architecture side. So working with a lot of data, so the big data and the Hadoop and Spark and all that, and, you know, whatever data and bringing it together and, and understanding the business processes. And then the predictive analytics and the machine learning come into that advanced analytics. And I would see that data science covers all of those things. And I mean, that's a pretty huge kind of skill set to have. I think the machine learning is um, what was being discussed earlier about this kind of feedback of when we have this statistical understanding of the data and this is the kind of recommendations that we're kind of making out of it um, and potentially, you know, automatically feeding that back into an application. So that would be my summary. What's your take on that? I'm going to defer to Eugene and see if he has a if he has anything. <laughs> oh, the difference between machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that data science—that's the question, right? It's totally not an interview question. Jeez, as as a non-expert, ooh, well, can I work at Channel Advisor no, if I get no. it right? <laughs> I hear you guys have an opening. All right, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, in my mind, the distinction between all three is the first to describe a set of technologies and mathematical principles. So machine learning primarily refers to unsupervised learning in my mind. So that's basically you give it a, a data set and you're either saying, okay, here, do some clustering, or maybe you do have a training set. So maybe it's more supervised learning. You're saying, okay, this 20% is right and this 80% isn't. But in either case, you're basically able to give the algorithm some data and you tell it, go run with it. Give me an answer. Artificial intelligence, in my mind, is a much broader set of algorithms that maybe someone did some hand coding for, but it's replacing something that we would normally associate with human intelligence. So a good example is facial recognition. I don't think you're going to get to facial recognition from just a lot of base principles, you're going to have to have a lot more hand coding, a lot more human intelligence injected into there. 
And then data science, I think, isn't really a set of techniques and principles as much as it is an overlap of three important areas of career. And it's, you know, programming, statistics, and domain knowledge of what it means to work with the business. So if I was in a mock interview and I had to answer that question, that's how I'd try and break it up. Okay, that's that's interesting. I... <laughs> Does that mean wrong interesting? <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, some of this is going to be opinion-based. Uh, I've heard so many different sure. people talk about this in different ways, and some people say there are three totally different things. Other people have said, ah, they're very related, very close to one another. So I think some of it is opinion, and there's somebody currently raging, probably driving right now, yelling at the oh, radio yeah. that I'm totally wrong on this, and that they have the correct answer, and <laughs> Keep yelling. I totally agree with you, person raging on the drive. <laughs> For me, um, I can get behind that, that concept of data science as a confluence of a few different skills or an emphasis particularly on the statistical analysis side. The machine learning, I agree with Nikki, this is a feedback process. It's an algorithm that you give information, it spits out results, and as a process of finding out whether or not the results were correct or not. So matching reality versus prediction. It then is able to take those changes and find a way to improve the algorithm itself in the process. An example of this is a method that's called the online passive aggressive algorithm, which is how I tweet. (laughs) (laughs) No, the, the concept is that you basically have, say, really easy example, two categories. Is this a cap? Is this not a cap? And you show it pictures and say, this is a cat. And it it eventually will predict this is a cat or this is not a cat. And based on a set of weights that we won't get into, it predicts that something is a cat and it's really a turtle. So you tell it, no, this is not a cat. What will happen is that when you give it the feedback that, no, this is not a cat, all of the weights change to the point where the marginal decision becomes, no, this is not a cat. And then you go to the next picture. Is this a cat? And every time it's correct, it's passive. It stays, all the weights stay the same. Every time it's wrong, it's aggressive. It aggressively changes to make that last answer correct. So it's consistently learning based off of results that are fed and can learn from actual responses to predicted events. That's the machine learning part, that it's learning from its results. Artificial intelligence, I take a much more behavioralistic approach to AI and think of it as agents who are acting, where an agent is some independent process. Actions derive from some thought process or some uh, set of rules or heuristics that are built into the agent or that the agent learns over time based on stimuli. And then it performs some action. It will select that this is a cat or not a cat, or that it will go find all of the cats in the room and move them over to a certain location. So this is, in my mind, it's something that is not so much a technique as much as it is a precursor for some thing performing actions. And that was Philosophy Corner with Kevin. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. There you go. I was going to say, until Elon Musk says I can start using it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to treat it with a grain of salt. 